What's going on, everybody? <clears throat> as soon as I get on the mic, my throat clogs up. How's it going? I'm Ian Douglas. I am the author of the website, techinterview.guide. Um, I'm here to help you get better at tech interviews and getting jobs in the tech industry, or at least my perspectives and my thoughts on said subject. Um, cool. Hope everybody's doing good. If you're in chat, say hello. Let me know where you're at. Um, tell me how your week's going. Um, uh, see what do we got going on here? I'm going to do a giveaway next week. Uh, I got some pretty cool stuff going on this 3d printer and the 3d printers off to the side. Um, uh, oh, can I show you those? I think I can show you those. Let me switch over to this camera. Well, you can't really see it cause it's in the dark cause it's a surprise. So, um, but all three of these printers have things going on. Uh, and I'm going to do some giveaways next week. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, should be fun. In the meantime, I've been mass producing copious quantities of just little snowflake designs in various colors. So doing cool, like little silver and like kind of this metallic blue purple and then like gold and transparent and then just plain white. Um, but I made a ridiculous like over <laughs> over quantity uh, of of those. So oodles and oodles. If you're in the Denver area and you'd like some free snowflakes, uh, let me know. So my my kids' school typically have like a winter festival of some kind where we would sell ridiculous things like this infinite you know uh, folding cube. It's like th this infinite fidget cube thing, and we would just print like tons and tons of these. Um, and they're not doing the winter festival this year. So normally we would print tons of things like this and then sell them at the, uh, at the festival. And we would do things like this little pencil holder that I've got here. And I've got one on my desk here that's in black. Um, and we would just print like tons of this stuff and vases and stuff like that and sell them. Um, but they're not, uh, they're not doing it this year. So Ninja stars are just kind of sitting on my desk now. And it's like, okay, what am I going to do with all this stuff? So, um, but the stuff I got going on the printers are super, super cool. And they are in some really interesting filaments. One is a temperature changing filament. So depending on how warm or cold it is, it will change color. Um, one is in kind of a rainbow, uh, sort of filament. So the, the color will change as it prints so some of it's going to be in one color and be other colors as it as it uh, prints taller and then another one's in this really cool like shiny black um, but i'm not going to tell you what it is but i am going to do a giveaway probably next sunday this coming sunday um next thursday is thanksgiving so i'm probably not going to stream next thursday um i haven't decided yet so you tell me whether i should stream next thursday if you want me to stream, if you got questions, if you just want to like hang out and chat, I will hang out and chat. Um, but I'm probably going to be on the verge of like food coma uh, because I do love cooking Thanksgiving dinner and I'm all about the turkey and the dressing and all the side dishes and stuff like that. So um, I'll probably be around one way or another. So if folks have questions, I may I may just hop online just to say happy Thanksgiving. Um, but otherwise... I may not stream next week. I don't know. We'll see. If you want me to stream, let me know. Uh, drop a comment. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube later, let me know in the comments uh, if you want me to stream um, or if you're going to hang out. If not, that's okay too. Uh, I don't mind taking a vacation. So hope you're all doing well though. Um, big thanks to the last couple of followers since the last stream. DG776 looks like uh, you were last up. So appreciate the follow there. Um, yeah, I've been following a lot of other uh, streamers lately that are doing some really cool music on uh, on Twitch. And it's been really fun just kind of interacting with them and, and watching people do live uh, live music on Twitch. It's been pretty neat. Um, cool, we've got a handful of viewers. So yeah, I think I'm just going to jump in. Tonight's going to be Q&A, Ask Me Anything. Um, definitely drop those questions in chat as we go. Uh, you can always check out the YouTube channel here. I'll drop that in chat and uh, you can kind of uh, let me know if you've got questions along the way. Um, let's see, aside from that, it's been a busy week. Uh, work has been busy, side stuff has been busy. Um, oh, finished uh, some of the Python script processing for you know chopping up these, uh, these Q&A videos later. 
Um, so I got that down to a science now. I've, I've, uh, I can basically run my little Rails app, put in all the timers, and then I record the, uh, the extra voiceovers uh, for the podcast intro and put all those timers in. And then I just run this Python script and it pulls all the stuff out of the database and it chops everything up and away it goes. And it's great. So now I just have to figure out when am I going to release all this stuff? I have a handful of backlogged uh, videos and podcasts uh, that I may do through December, but I think starting on the last Q&A, so last Thursday's Q&A and tonight's Q&A, I may release in January um, and I may take part of December off. I'll probably still stream, but it might just be like hanging out and just chatting and stuff like that. And I would love to have some guests on the stream. So if you just want to like, chat it doesn't have to be interview related if you just want to hang out on the stream and just chat and let me know what's going on in your life and you know what you got going on with holidays and stuff like that if you're taking a holiday break if you celebrate the holidays or not um i'd love to just have folks on the stream so let me know if you uh, if you want to be a guest no pressure um happy to do like just audio if you want to be like just an audio participant so we'll figure all that out as we go. But if you're uh, if you're in chat, say hello. Let me know you're there. Let me know how your week is going. Um, my week has been otherwise kind of busy, just filling it up with uh, with stuff, and uh, hopefully have some more interesting things to talk about there uh, in the next little while. Uh, I've got some folks from Stream that are coming into town next week. Uh, one of them being our CTO, and um, so hopefully uh, get to interact with him a little bit. Uh, I want to chat with him about our interview process. Oh, uh, I was on a podcast yesterday um, called Greater Than Code, and that is going to be released next Wednesday. And we basically had a really good hour-long conversation on how badly the tech interview process is just horrible and garbage and needs to die in fire. Um, and several of us kind of got up on our soapboxes and talked about like we should do this and we should do that and we should do this other thing and basically the conversation turned into what if the community rallied together and came up with ideas on uh like what the interview process should be and then what if we got companies to commit to trying it that way you know try it for a quarter report back to the community like this is what we tried this was the results that we got these are the metrics that we tracked this is why we think that that actually worked out okay um and so we kind of ended the podcast with we should do this like we should actually get a community together to start doing this um and so they're going to invite me to a slack community uh about this well not specifically that topic but they're going to invite me to a slack community about the podcast and i think several of us are going to like get together so big thanks to uh mandy and Artie for letting me hang out on the podcast yesterday um again it's called greater than code and i think it'll be out next wednesday is when they told me um it'll be pretty fun i got a little i got a little soapboxy i'm not gonna lie i got a little preachy on uh how bad the tech interview uh process is really broken and needs a complete overhaul and uh went on and on and on at length i'm i'm sure by the end of it they're like shut up about the tech interview process already but they asked they're like what's on your mind and i'm like let me tell you what's on my mind lately <laughs> Um, but it was a really good conversation and, and just really good collaborative uh, kind of conversation. I love being on podcasts and, and talking about that kind of stuff. Cool. So yeah, tonight's just going to be Q&A, Ask Me Anything. So if you're stopping by in chat, feel free to uh, drop questions in there if you got any. I've got a handful of things uh, that I want to chat about kind of as we go. Um, I've also got the channel points that you can redeem. So the little bubble underneath the chat, if you're on Twitch watching this live, uh, feel free to redeem uh, those chat points. You can redeem them now for dad jokes, uh, reminding me to stay hydrated. I have a plethora of, of uh, tasty drinks with me. Um, or if you want me to do like, you know, silly question like is cereal considered soup? Uh, things like that. So got all kinds of uh, interesting stuff we can do there. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much going to cover the intro. Oh, still cranking away on the, uh, tech interview email lists. I don't know if they're going to be ready by the end of November. I really, really hope they're going to be done by the end of November, but we'll see where that goes. Um, yeah, gosh, I don't know. Editing my own stuff. I'm such a like perfectionist wannabe that, um, I always feel like they're not ready enough. 
but I think at some point you just like done is better than perfect, right? Is, is kind of that saying. So I just, I want to get it done. I want to get it out there and I will iterate on it over time and get feedback from the readers, uh, which would be all of you folks. Um, if you subscribe, um, let's see, aside from that, uh, let's do some resume reviews. I think next week, um, potentially on Sunday or maybe the following Thursday, uh, I'm going to have a, uh, someone that I worked with at SendGrid uh, in the HR team. He was kind of the head of HR. His name is Josh. Um, I asked him if he would be on the stream and, and he said, yeah. So we're going to get him on the stream at some point. I would love to do some resume reviews with him. So if you have a resume of any kind in any shape, form, uh, you know, what, like even if you're not like job hunting, um, I would love to just get a whole bunch of resumes. So check out techinterview.guide slash streaming. There's a form on there where you can send me a resume. And uh, what I'd love to do is just have a, like an episode where Josh and I just kind of break down resumes and talk about like what he looks for as like head of HR and what I would look for as a hiring manager, just to give you all some perspective on how like an applicant tracking system might see it and then how he would view it to hand it off to me and how I might view it. Um, I love kind of getting the whole picture of like how all those things work. Um, and so I would love for a handful of you to send in some resumes uh, and we'll pick probably three or four and we'll just spend some time just quickly glancing over it. Like we'll do like the 10 second view. Like I'm literally going to put it up on the screen for 10 seconds and I'll take it away and I'll get his impression of like, what did you take away from that in 10 seconds? Uh, what did you, what, like, what did you get? Would you call that person or not? And then we'll actually put it back on the screen and we'll like go over it in detail and, uh, you know, try to decide like, oh yes, he wants to call that person. Now let's go look at the resume and figure out what other detail, uh, Josh might take away from that to make him inclined to want to call you. And, uh, so yeah, so send me in some resumes and we'll do some, uh, resume reviews there. Um, what else is going on? I think that's pretty much it. So yeah, keep asking questions, drop those in chat as we go. Um, otherwise I got just a handful of questions. So again, keep sending in those questions. Uh, they've been fantastic. I've got a lot of notes and, and thoughts to kind of think through and talk through, uh, around tech hiring. We're going to talk about leak code. We're going to talk about, uh, like progressing in your career. Some, someone asked a question about like, at what point are you going to be like a team lead kind of thing? Um, questions about resumes, questions about job applications. So we're going to cover kind of a lot of ground today. Um, and some of the questions or some of the answers that I give will be a little bit longer than usual. Uh, those are seeming to do a little bit better on YouTube and on the podcast as far as engagement goes. So I think I'm going to keep aiming for like the five plus minute answers as opposed to like the 30 second, two minute uh, kind of range that I have done in the past. I think the longer ones uh, definitely get a little more engagement and a little more content in there. Um, but I do need to be careful that I stay on topic on those answers for sure. Cause sometimes I, I stray off topic a little bit. So yeah, let's, uh, let's dive in. So if you got questions, ask those in chat and we'll, uh, we'll address those kind of as we go. And yeah, we'll just kind of answer some questions for the night. We'll see how long this goes. Might kick off a little early, see how, how well my voice, uh, sort of holds up for the day, but I'm going to start by hydrating. All right. Let's dive in. Actually, what I should do is I should grab my notepad. Where's my notepad? There's my notepad to here. And we're going to grab here. There we go. Cool. So I'm just going to paste the questions in here kind of as we go, um, just so you'll see that on the screen. I realized uh, after watching my last Q&A video that I did not do that. Um, so we'll make sure that we, uh, that we do that. So yeah, check out the, uh, the bang help. Uh, you'll see a whole bunch of commands that you can do in there. Um, and yeah, redeem those chat points as we go too. All right, let's see how well this is gonna wrap on the screen as we go here. Is that actually gonna wrap around? It does, okay, cool. Does tech hiring go through cycles of entry level roles and mid to senior level roles? I'm feeling really frustrated at the low number of entry level roles that I'm seeing right now. You and me both. 
There are so many companies out there that are trying to hire, but their expectation is that they're going to find all these mid-level, senior-level folks to fill those jobs because they want people to hit the ground running. They don't want to spend the time and the money and the energy training somebody new. They just want to hire you and have you make an impact right away. The downside of that then means that a lot of companies don't want to hire entry level developers unless you show that you can actually hit the ground running on a particular part of their tech stack that you can immediately contribute, then they might take a chance on you. So I think a lot of the application process, I think a lot of how you talk about yourself and what you bring to the company really needs to engage them on this is what I bring to you. And this question was actually brought up in the chat during the last Q&A and I missed it because chat was going by. So I apologize for, for missing uh, this last time. When we apply for these jobs, the key thing that you need to get across on the resume and in the cover letter and how you're applying for this job is that you're not leveling yourself. You're not calling yourself an entry level dev. You are just calling yourself a software developer or a software engineer. Uh, if you're in America, you can call yourself a software engineer. If you're in Canada, engineer is actually a reserved title and you actually have to be an actual engineer to call yourself a software engineer. But in the United States, you can call yourself a software engineer. But call yourself software developer, web developer, software engineer, but don't attach a level on there. Don't say I'm a junior. Don't draw attention to the fact that you're a new graduate. Don't draw attention to that you just finished a boot camp. You need to just present yourself as a software developer and just apply for that job. Let them worry about how to level you. Let them look at how much experience you have, but don't draw attention to that. In the cover letter, instead of saying, hi, I'm Ian, I'm a recent graduate, to say, hi, I'm Ian, I'm a software developer and I'm applying for the software development role. Now they're going to be more likely to call you because they're not necessarily going to catch right away that you're a brand new graduate or that you're, you know, new in the tech industry and that you're trying to find that first job. You don't have to draw attention to that. You want to try and sell them on the idea of I'm a developer. This is what I'm bringing to your company. This is how I'm going to help your team. This is the experience and the background that I'm bringing. These are the skills that I'm bringing that you're looking for that I happen to have. You should call me. That's the theme of the cover letter. You're not gonna use those exact words. I've got a whole video on the YouTube channel about how to write up that cover letter. But in the first paragraph of that cover letter, you're just gonna say, I'm a developer. I've got the skill that you want. I've got the background that you want. I bring cool experience and life experience and so on. I'm bringing that to the team. I'm gonna make the team better. I'm gonna make the company better. You should call me don't highlight at all like i'm looking for mentorship or i'm looking to grow in this opportunity or anything like that you don't want to make the cover letter have any kind of indication of things that you want from them aside from you want them to call you that's the only ask that you should put in the cover letter is i want you to call me aside from that the cover letter and the resume should be all about what you're bringing to them and i think that that's gonna sort of sneak through the gate a little bit and you may find yourself more likely to get phone calls. As far as the theme of the question, does the tech hiring industry kind of go through cycles of entry level roles and so on? There can be. A lot of companies that open themselves up to internships tend to open those internship applications, usually in the fall, in order to hire for interns in the spring because that's when a lot of universities and colleges graduate their students. And so they, or, or that's when they're gonna take like the summer break. And so they wanna try to scoop up those students early so that as soon as you start that summer break, you can start your internship. And now you've got like a three month internship and then you finish that internship and you go back to class. Or you, you, you know, you might get a bit of a break before and after, but you're mostly gonna use that time off between your uh, sort of university terms or college terms or semesters, whatever. And you're going to use that time to actually do an internship. And when internships really first came to be, it was like, oh, it's spring. We should hire an intern 
let's post that job post and then everybody's scrambling. And so companies started doing them earlier and earlier. And then, you know, one company's like, all right, well, we're going to, we're going to start advertising that internship in April. Well, the next company's like, well, if we do it a couple of weeks before that, then we're going to get the interns earlier. And then, you know, everybody else gets to pick what's left over. And so companies started going earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier to where it wrapped around the tail end of the year. And now a lot of those spring and summer internship opportunities, those job posts actually happen typically from my experience in October and November. And so a lot of the intern roles that you'll see, they're like, yeah, we're looking for an intern to start next spring. But if you're looking for an internship now, companies may not be ready for it, but they might be. We also see in Q4, the last couple of years, Q4 uh, has actually had more hiring than there has been historically. Historically, Q4 tends to slow down quite a lot because a lot of companies' budgets sort of refresh in the new year. Some companies do their fiscal year, their financial year, starting in January. Some of them offset it into February or March just to make tax time a little bit easier and wrapping up the end of the year and so on. But they typically refresh all of the budgets of like, oh, you want more money to hire more people on your team? You got to wait till January or you got to wait till February. And now you've got more money that you can go spend on salary and you can actually hire someone for your team. So historically, Q4 has been a slower hiring season for like an actual full-time role where we might see that hiring really pick up in the new year. But in 2019 and 2020, we actually saw the Q4 hiring pick up quite a bit. So while I was teaching at Turing, we actually saw a pretty big uptick in hiring full-time roles in Q4. Whether that's gonna hold out in 2021, I haven't seen. Because <clears throat> unfortunately, most of the trending that I've seen in 2021 is people looking for mid to senior level developers. What's infuriating to me though, are companies who are posting quote unquote entry level roles or junior level roles, but expecting two to four years of work experience. Well, it's not an entry level role if you're expecting experience. And I think what's happening is companies are like, well, if we call it entry level, then they can't complain when we pay them a lower salary, but we're going to ask them to have a couple of years of experience. Well, all that means is that that company wants to take advantage of you and the fact that you have a couple of years experience and try to pay you less money. And I think the job market right now is hot enough that you can push back on that and say, you know what, I've got two to four years experience, but you're not going to be paying me entry level wage. You're going to pay me what I'm worth for two to four years of professional production level work experience. So advocate for yourself on that. Negotiate for that kind of stuff. Companies expect you to negotiate, but you must negotiate. You don't want to get stuck with an entry level salary when you have work experience. <clears throat> Companies right now still think that they hold a lot of power on that. And I think it's very much a candidate's market where you can quit your job and you can find a job and make more money. And if companies aren't willing to pay that extra money, then they're going to lose out on candidates. So um, to strictly answer the question, does tech hiring kind of go through this cycle of, of entry level and, and mid to senior? I would say mid to senior level roles are gonna happen all year round. I would say you probably find more entry level and intern level roles in October, November for companies that are trying to hire for next spring. But some companies will do internships all year round because they realize people start and stop university and college and boot camps and, and coding programs all throughout the year. And so if you really want an internship at a company, like you're really interested in a particular company, start doing that network and outreach to that company and start dropping hints like, hey, I'm looking for an internship. Do you have any intern roles available? If so, when are those internships opening? Or are you just hiring for interns like all the time? Can I just get in on like the next cycle of internship uh, hiring and see what they say? It can't hurt. So use the networking and the outreach and talk to the company about it and find out what they've got available. They may wanna hire an intern in the spring, but you can say, you know what? I want an internship, but I wanna work now. Like, do you have anything now that I can do as an intern? 
that might actually save them a lot of headache. Instead of waiting until next summer to bring you on as an intern, they might be able to bring you on sooner. Can't hurt to ask. So uh, go ahead and ask the company and see if that'll help you out. Hmm. All right, let me grab this next question here. <laughs> this question's a little bit longer. Hopefully it'll fit on the screen here. I was on Leak Code and saw that you can filter questions by company. Should I practice every single question listed for a company where I want to apply? Um, and I would say it's really about the type of the problem and the pattern of the problem. Like, is this a subset sum kind of problem? I realize I pasted in some of my notes on the screen. Should the, the, the question is, should I practice every question for a particular company? And let's just use Twitter as an example. So let's say you go to leak code and you try to find all the questions that Twitter might ask. Well, <clears throat> I can guarantee you that <clears throat> I can guarantee you that companies that find themselves on those kinds of lists immediately change those questions but they're probably still going to ask the type of problem so in this case um you know if you've got say a heap problem or a subset sum problem as i mentioned on, on the notes there if twitter is known to ask that kind of question they're probably still going to ask that pattern of question but the exact leak code problem that you find on leak code, they're never gonna ask you that exact question because otherwise what's gonna be happening is they're just biasing their interview process towards people that just sit around on leak code and do nothing but leak code. And there's nothing wrong with sitting around on leak code and practicing those leak code challenges, but I think that companies aren't going to ask that exact question because they don't want you to come in and go, oh yeah, cool, this looks like an interesting problem. Let me just blast through that in three minutes because I've seen it before and I've practiced it a bunch of times. Companies aren't gonna get good signals about you as a candidate if you can just blast through a problem. They actually wanna hear, what is your thought process? What is your problem solving process? What, like, how are you making the decisions about how you're writing that code? That's really what they want to find in the interview when they're asking you to do that live code. They want to hear your process. They don't, they don't sometimes care as much about, can you even solve it? Or can you solve it in an efficient way? <clears throat> Excuse me. They just want to hear your thought process. They want to hear how you're choosing to work through that problem. So going back to the question itself, if, if a company finds the questions that they would typically ask on some of these lists, whether it's leak code or Glassdoor or other places where you can say like, what kinds of questions is Twitter gonna ask in my interview? As soon as Twitter sees those lists, and I guarantee that their HR people and their interview teams are constantly looking out for those things on, online. As soon as they see uh, somebody leaked that question, they're gonna stop asking that question in the interview. Like immediately they're gonna stop asking that question. So if you find those lists, it's okay to practice those patterns of questions, but just know you're like the chance that you actually get that exact question are pretty much zero. I've actually got some videos on YouTube that you can look at for how to look through the patterns of leak code problems and study the patterns and the strategies behind those patterns to prepare for those kinds of things. So do you, do you need to, you know, go through and find and practice every question on leak code that's tagged as a twitter question i don't know that you need to do all of them but i think as you kind of work your way through them you're going to start to see kind of the the the, the frequency pattern of how often you know uh like a heat problem comes up or how often uh you know an array problem comes up or a two-pointer problem comes up and you can also use sean prashad's website for that i'll grab the url for that in a moment um and you can use these things. Let me drop that in chat for you. Um, you can use sites like Sean's where you could say like, go find all the questions for Twitter and you can then kind of group them by the category or pattern of problem and then figure out, okay, well, if Twitter 
you know, if like a third of the questions that they're likely to ask are going to be heat problems, then maybe I need to study heat problems more frequently, but I still need to rotate through other kinds of problems. So go check out my YouTube channel for those leak code uh, videos. I've got a couple of them on there now. So just search for leak code on my channel and you'll find those, uh, those videos. Um, but yeah, just keep in mind that when companies do see those lists online, they're going to stop asking those questions, but they're probably still like they're asking that pattern of question for a reason. There's something about that kind of problem that's giving them a good signal, as we call it in, in, the, in the hiring side of things. They're looking for good signals. Like if you understand why you put something in a heap, then that's going to benefit you in some way on that job, hopefully. I mean, I've, I've certainly sat through uh, interviews where the style of lead code challenge they give you is completely out of whack with what the company actually does. But hopefully companies are picking these kinds of challenges that are actually in line with what you're going to do on the job. And they're going to use the data structures on the job that are used in these technical challenges. Not always, but hopefully they are. So look at the frequency of, of those questions that you see on those curated lists whether it's Sean's website or someone else's website and look at the frequency of those questions and then practice them accordingly. So if you see a particular problem showing up, like a type of problem showing up in those lists more frequently, practice that one more frequently. Taking a look at chat, uh, DG776, uh, welcome to the chat. It says, I have an IT interview next Monday. It'll be a technical interview. I'm really nervous about it. What kind of common tech questions will be asked for a tier one IT position. Well, first off, welcome to the chat. Appreciate the follow. And IT means slightly different things to different kinds of folks. But in my experience, IT roles tend to be like internal kind of like desktop support. And you can correct me in chat if I'm if I'm off base, if you can describe uh, the role a little bit more. But in my experience, IT roles tend to be more like, you know, uh, my laptop won't print on the office printer or I'm trying to install some software and that's not working right or I can't connect to the network and so on. And you're confirming in chat that that's right. Okay, cool. So I'll keep going down the, that path. The, the kinds of interview questions that you may face may be things like, um, how do we set up, you know, um, what's the authentication system in Windows? Uh, you know, if they're like a Windows-based organization, they're going to have how to set up like user groups and individual user accounts and so on. Uh, is it LDAP? Uh, they may ask questions about how do you set up those kinds of authentication systems. Now, if it's tier one, you may not be that deep into how to set those things up, assuming that tier one means entry level role. Um, some places like flip the numbers and the lower the number, the higher the rank. Uh, so you can correct me on that. But if, if tier one in your in your chat question is kind of that entry level IT role, then it may be a little bit more about how well do you interact with people and, and can you talk to them in everyday lingo about how to explain what a driver is? And, um, you know, can you just like how how do you ask them questions to help them debug, especially if it's a remote kind of scenario, like if they're calling you up and saying, hey, DG, you know, I'm trying to you know, hook up some new peripheral to my laptop and it's not working. Well, how do you talk them through that? Like, talk me through the process of, you know, have you power cycled things? Have you, you know, how are you plugging it in? What kind of plug is it? Is it actually plugged into the, like a power socket? Is it turned on? And when you're asking those kinds of questions, what they're going to be listening for is like, are you asking in a respectful way or are you coming across kind of condescending? Like, hey, dummy, did you plug it in? Like they want to make sure that you're being professional about it because these are coworkers and it's a professional setting. And so they want to hear like how you might interact with your coworkers around these kinds of things. And so it will typically be things like authentication and authentication groups, maybe firewalls, because you're also going to be working on like the overall like office network, like the internet connection for the office. How do you split that up? Um, how would you monitor the internet connection to to some degree not that you're spying on people but like you know if you suddenly you see this big massive spike in upload traffic does that mean that somebody's like pushing like all the source code from their laptop out to the internet somewhere like do you need to watch out for that how would you monitor those kinds of things i don't know how deep 
those kinds of questions may come up. Some of those may be more senior level as far as like the monitoring software. But with the the general theme that I that I talk about on the on the live stream here is my job as the interviewer is to find out your range of knowledge, both the breadth of your knowledge as well as the depth of your knowledge. How many different things do you know and then how deep do you know those things? And so I'm going to keep asking questions until you can't give me answers. And it's okay not to have answers for things, especially for an entry level role. You don't have to know all the things. My job is just to find out the extent of your knowledge and then figure out whether that actually fits in what we're looking for on the team. And so a lot of people go into these interviews thinking, oh, I got to know everything about everything about everything. And you really don't. By the time you go to that interview on Monday, you know what you know, you don't know what you don't know, and that's okay. I would say the night before, get a good night's sleep, drink lots of water, hydrate your body, and that's actually going to help your memory recall. It'll help with dopamine levels if you get a good night's sleep and you know don't drink a bunch of caffeine. Don't try to cram the night before. That's not going to help. I would say stop studying by Saturday. Get off the screen completely on Sunday and just rest your brain, rest your eyeballs, and just mentally prepare yourself, emotionally prepare yourself for going into that interview. Some people use like visualization techniques, like imagine yourself succeeding in that interview or try to imagine the kinds of questions that they might ask and just play those answers in your head. But don't actually like sit down on a, on a computer and like type out those answers. Do that before Sunday. Take most of Sunday off and just relax your brain so that when you go to that interview on Monday, you're going to be as ready as you can be. Last minute cramming almost never works for interviews unless you're reading like the morning of. Like if your interviews at like say 11 a.m., then maybe between like nine and 10, you can do like a little bit of last minute study just to fill up your short term memory a little bit. But I would say from that 10 to 11, like don't study, like don't, don't be cramming things like right up to the very last moment. I would say spend at least the half hour before that interview making sure your internet works. Like go reboot your router and, and reboot your Wi-Fi. Um, you know, make sure that the lighting uh, is good if it's going to be a remote interview. If you're going on site, then make sure you know the directions, you know where to park and all that kind of stuff. But if it's a remote interview, make sure that you're ready for that interview. And so don't cram and study and then go, oh shoot, my internet's not working. I need to go reboot and now you're late. Um, so try to prepare that sort of stuff ahead of time. Um, and then, yeah, I would say try to, try to anticipate the kinds of questions that they would ask. And, and I know that that's what you've asked me here on the stream. Um, and, and so from a desktop support point of view, like you'll be able to find common lists of, of IT desktop support types of questions, but I would say for an entry level role, part of it's going to be your depth of knowledge, but a lot of it is also going to be how you communicate and can you explain things in everyday language that doesn't sound like you're being condescending or it doesn't sound like you're using so much technical lingo and terminology that you're going to confuse people because keep in mind not everybody's going to have the same level of technical knowledge as you and so they want to know that you can explain things in everyday language like explain how a, like explain what a driver is in just everyday language like if you had to explain this to the person that walks your dog or something like what would you tell them or if you had to explain it to you know whoever's making your coffee at the coffee shop you know on your way to the interview or something like how would you explain what a driver is to them and how to install that driver so find ways of using just common everyday language for you and and uh, what's going to be appropriate for that company but expect that you can go into some level of technical detail but I would say also be prepared to say, you know, if the person's not technical, like if it's someone on the tech team, then you can you can speak geek to them all day long. But if it's somebody in say sales or marketing that don't have a technical background, then you need to use more everyday language and stuff. So just a, a few kind of extra pointers on there. <clears throat> and then following up a chat, uh, confirming it. Yeah, it's entry level. Thanks for the tips. I'll start studying and preparing tomorrow. Take most of the Sunday off. Yeah, I think that that's, that's good. Just rest the brain. I think that that'll be important. And it is going to be a remote interview. I'll need to go to Best Buy to buy a webcam since my front facing camera on my phone broke. Yeah, um, but set that up sooner than later. So like try to get that webcam soon 
so that you work out any issues and that it's completely ready to go by Monday morning. You don't want to like go out Sunday night and buy the thing and then realize Monday morning it's not going to work. Um, or that, yeah. although if you're in IT, you should be able to get this stuff to work, right? I mean, that would be the, uh, the, the point of that. So um, yeah, get, get the webcam sooner than later and then work out any issues with that. Make sure driver updates and things like that are happening. So you're 100% ready to go. Um, have good lighting. There are some videos that you can watch about how to do lighting, like make the light face you. Don't sit with like a bright window behind you because that'll, that'll make uh, like your features really dark and it'll be hard to see you. They want to see how you're going to sort of interact on a, on a personal level. So you can watch videos on like how to light yourself well for conferences and, and stuff like that. So whether the light is right in front of you or just off to one side at kind of a 45 degree angle tends to be most effective for that kind of stuff. But yeah, good luck on Monday. Um, let me know how that goes. Stay in touch with me and, and let me know how that goes. <clears throat> just going to stay hydrated here. Although sipping coffee at 7.30 at night is probably not the greatest idea. Speaking of getting a good night's sleep. <clears throat> All right, this next answer is going to get a little bit long too because I had, I had some thoughts on this one. <clears throat> at what point in our career should we be expected to lead a team? I only have one year of experience and they want me to lead a project team and I'm super nervous. I would be super nervous too. I have led teams in the past though. My second job out of college, I had only been out of college. Well, so getting out of college, I started a tech support role. About a little over a year later, I left that job, took another job, worked on a project for six to eight months and then they put me on another team. and. Uh, uh, a classmate of mine from college who graduated a year after me, he joined the team. But we started using the operating system of the company where I worked in that tech support role. And so they actually, they didn't make me like the official team lead, but I actually got to be sort of in charge of some of that project because I had a deep understanding of this real-time operating system that we used, that we were using as kind of a basis for the other application that we were writing. And I was kind of nervous too. And I was also pretty excited of like, oh cool, I get to actually lead something. But most of the people on my team had way more experience than I did. And so I also felt very nervous. Every company though is gonna treat this kind of thing a little bit differently. And not everybody in tech is going to be expected to lead a team. So to strictly answer your question, at what point should we be expected to lead? Not everybody is going to be a lead. I think if you stay at a company long enough, just through the natural attrition of people leaving the company. If you stick around, you're the one with the most domain knowledge. And so they may ask you to lead a team because you have a lot of knowledge to share. But being a lead sometimes has kind of the inference of being a coach or training other people. And that's not always the case. I think being a lead just means that you've got enough seniority that you can make decisions because you understand how different things kind of work together. But again, that's going to be a little bit different for every company. So if you've been asked to do this and you've only got a year of experience, it's okay to be nervous, but I would do a couple of things. A, you need to ask for a little bit more money on salary because you're taking on more responsibility if that responsibility means that you're making harder decisions on behalf of the team or if you're coaching people on the team, then you should be paid a little bit more for that. Secondly, when I said it's okay to be nervous, the important thing to realize is if they're asking you to step up and be a lead, they trust you. They trust you enough to put you into that kind of role. And companies don't do that blindly. And so if they're asking you to step up into that, that means they, they actually believe in you. And so you can believe in you. It's hard to do sometimes, but it's okay to be nervous about it. But I think your company is clearly seeing enough potential in you and they've been happy enough with your work so far to think, you know what, this person could be in charge of other people so that those other people are gonna do it the way that you do it. So can you, I hope you can see it from that perspective that they see that you're a good example of an employee and they want you to lead so that other people follow your example. So I think 
not every company is going to expect you to take on a leadership role. Um, and, and I think that that's important to state. Um, and, and that also typically doesn't happen super early in your career. But at some point, they are going to hope that you're collaborative enough that you're willing to share your knowledge on a regular basis and help other people learn what you know. And that's kind of like the, the tagline that I put on my own stream around like share what you know and then we all win. And so the company is hoping that you're going to share your knowledge and share your experience and share your process with other people to be that example for them. Now, as far as being nervous, I get it. I get imposter syndrome all the time. It's a real thing in our industry. But again, I think that by realizing that your company trusts you, that you can rely on that trust, that you can still ask them for help. You can still ask your team for help. It doesn't mean you have to have all the answers. There are still people around you that want to see you succeed in that role. And so if you start feeling overwhelmed or unsure what to do, ask. You don't have to make things up as you go. Other people around you are willing to help. It's also perfectly okay, like I said, as a leader to not have an answer. But, you know, if you've been able to kind of demonstrate, I guess, to the company that you know how to go figure things out, or if you don't have an answer to show your team how you would go get that answer or who you need to go talk to on the team, like, oh, you know what? I don't know how to talk to that system either. Let's go talk to so-and-so because they built it. If you've been there for a year, you probably have connections uh, within the company that the new people being hired aren't going to have. And I think being able to show that level of transparency and vulnerability to your own team is going to go a long way as far as building that trust and respect. Because without trust, that team's not going to work well together. But if you're kind of like the know-it-all, then people are like, okay, well, you know, I guess if last resort, if I can't find an answer, I'm going to go talk to Ian because Ian will have an answer. You don't want them to be resentful about that. You want them to kind of think of you like, oh, I'm stuck on this. I need to go, I need to go ask Ian. I bet Ian will know. Like you want it to be a positive sort of like, oh, I bet Ian will have an answer. Um, and, but it's okay not to have an answer, especially when you've only been there for a year. Um, and especially if you've only been in the industry for a year, like if this is your first job and you've only been there for a year and they want you to lead a team, that's going to feel like a lot. And so it's okay not to have those answers and it's okay to ask other people in the company like, yeah, I don't know how to talk to that system either. Like, does anybody know how to talk to that system? Can we all like sit down and learn from you? Could you do like a lunch and learn or can you spend like half an hour with like three or four of us and we're all going to take notes so that we can all learn how to do this together? Showing that kind of leader quality of, you know what, I don't know the answer either. So I'm going to go find out who does know and I'm going to arrange for them to come teach all of us. Again, that's just going to build up a lot of trust and a lot of support from your own team where they realize you're on their side. And when you don't have an answer, you're going to help them learn, you know, who to who to talk to and so on as well. And as always, if you got other questions, uh, feel free to drop those in chat. Happy to take those kind of as we go. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going through uh, some questions that I've uh, had submitted to me over LinkedIn, over Twitter, and then just, uh, you know, questions that I'm finding online of, you know, that people are asking as well. Um, but feel free to uh, keep sending me these questions. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm Ian Douglas 736 on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And so you can connect with me there, follow me there. And my DMs are open on, on Twitter and you should be able to connect with me at any time on LinkedIn as well. If you are connecting on LinkedIn, I prefer a connection over a follow because uh, then you can use my network to uh, ask me to make introductions for you. I'm happy to help people that come through my stream to uh, get introduced to other people and, and help you out with that networking. So when you connect with me on LinkedIn, make sure you add a note and say, I was listening to the stream and I wanted to connect on LinkedIn. Like just drop a little note in there. Don't just say, I want to connect with Ian. I'll still connect with you either way, but if you let me know that you're coming from the stream, then I'm more likely to reach out to you and say, hey, cool, thanks for you know listening to the stream. Hope it's helpful. What can I help you with? Um, but if you're just connecting on LinkedIn just because, that's okay too. All right, so let's keep going through some more questions here. And uh, yeah, we'll wrap up in maybe a half hour or so. We'll see. We'll see how these questions go.
So what should I put on my resume to really stand out to startup companies? I'm a new graduate. I have thoughts about this. Most of my career has been in startups, and so I've got a lot of thoughts about what it's like to work at a startup and the pressures and the things that you need to know about working at a startup. I would say the first thing that you really need to communicate, and, and so again, going back to what I mentioned at the very beginning of the stream, uh, even though this question is going to get chopped up, I'll reiterate some of it here. When you're applying for a job, you need to really strongly promote what you're bringing to the company. You don't want to point out uh, things that you don't have or the fact that you're a new grad or you just graduated a boot camp or you're looking for an internship. Don't point any of that stuff out. Just call yourself a software developer and apply for that job. And then as you're applying for that job, you're just putting stuff on the resume that shows them what you're bringing to the company. Your cover letter is highlighting, I'm bringing this, I'm bringing this, I have this skill, I have this experience, this is how I'm gonna make the team better around me, this is how I'm gonna help the company. And just leave it at that. Let them figure out that you're a new graduate. You don't have to highlight that stuff for them. When it comes to working at a startup though, I think some of the key characteristics that startups really look for especially if it's a small startup company. The ability to multitask, to learn quickly and apply that knowledge, but also to pivot quickly on feedback and then deploying that often. Those are gonna be kind of the main things that you need to sort of portray, like these are the skills that you have, that you can juggle lots of things, that you can learn something quickly and apply that knowledge right away so maybe talk about, you know, in this particular project, I had a, a, a deadline to hit and I had to go learn a whole new thing. And I was able to learn that, code it up effectively, get it deployed and meet the deadline. That's really what startups are gonna care about is can you deploy, can you iterate based on feedback and can you get stuff out there? Startups are trying to build their audience. They're trying to build their business. They're trying to win customers over and they're gonna do that with speed. And it's all about time to market on that. So based on my own experience, because I've worked at a lot of startups over my career, I've, I've actually lost count. It's more than a dozen, probably closer to 15 startups at this point, uh, including a bunch of freelance uh, work that I did where I was working with startups and mentoring startups. In my experience, um, I really like working on small teams where anybody on the team can kind of jump in and take ownership on something or help somebody else get something done even if that means we're kind of designing it as we go and learning kind of as we build it. There's kind of this analogy of, you know, are you, are you building the boat while you're already like pushing off the dock kind of thing? Like, are you, are you building the vehicle while you're driving down the road? I would say a lot of the common things that you might learn at a boot camp are probably going to go out the window, like testing and documentation. They tend to be the first things that get thrown away because there's just not enough time. Or at least that's the perception a lot of the time. Because that time to market is such a huge goal for most startups that they're like, yeah, we'll do testing later. Or we'll do the documentation later or someone else can write the documentation later on. But for now, we just we got to get this done. We got to get this feature out. We got to get this rolled out. We got to get it deployed. And so just be aware that they may not want you to do like a hundred percent like code coverage kind of thing or even into the 90 percentage uh percentile in my experience in a startup you generally only want to unit test the really business critical portions of the code to make sure that those things are bulletproof no matter what and then like you know maybe the feature testing and integration testing maybe that kind of falls by the wayside but you've at least got strong unit testing around kind of the core functionality of what your code does but documentation is pretty much like the last thing anybody wants to do. So I generally tell new graduates though, if you're, if you're a fresh grad, and in this case, the, the person asking this, this question was a new graduate, I generally advise staying away from startups because startups, they generally want people who have very sort of niche knowledge or very deep knowledge on a particular topic or they want experience where you've already worked at a startup in the past and you know what that energy level is going to be and the pressure that comes with that and kind of that entrepreneurial vibe of like everybody's kind of like a founder everybody's got 
a stake in this. Everybody's got to like work as much as possible. And I've certainly been at startups where like I was literally working 90 hours a week for almost 13 months straight, like months at a time. And then like take a, you know, take part of a week off and then I'm back at it for 90 hours a week again and again. And it can, it can burn you out. And I think coming out of school where you're probably already tired and you're like, oh good, I'm finally done. I finally graduated. I got through all the exams or I got through my final projects or I got through that boot camp or coding program and I'm exhausted. Do you really want to get into a job where you're working 80 hours a week? I mean, some people do. Some people are willing to put in that kind of energy, uh, but not everybody will. So not a lot of new graduates are ready to take that on as a lifestyle, but some are. Some startups also pay a little bit less than industry average, but they because they want to make up for it in equity. That can be a risky move for you, but keep in mind that subsequent jobs, the salary at those jobs aren't based on the salary that you made at this job. So if your first job, if you if you go to a startup and they pay a little bit less, let's say they're paying you like 70k, but they offer you like tons and tons and tons of equity. Well, it doesn't mean that the next job you have to make only a little bit more than 70K. If you're at that startup for a year or two, and typically in your area, someone with a year or two of experience might make 100K. Well, that next job, you can tell them you want to make 100K. If they say, well, what was your previous salary? You don't have to tell them. You can just say, it doesn't matter what my last salary was. I've got two years experience. I want to make 100K. And they need to be okay with that. So your previous salary doesn't dictate your next salary, but in a startup sometimes, depending on how well funded that, that startup is, they may offer slightly lower pay because they wanna make up for it in equity. And equity is meant to be this like, you know, you're gonna be a millionaire someday, but that equity is really worthless. It's really worthless. Like I, I keep a box of Kleenex on my desk for Kleenex reasons, but uh, I often joke like that, that box of Kleenex is probably more valuable than stock options until that company has what we call an exit event where that equity is now actually worth something to the outside world and not just you as an employee. It's worthless. It's literally tissue paper. Like anything they print that on is literally like, you know, it's worthless. You could throw it in the trash. Um, but the, the enticing part of working at a small startup is that you get this equity and you typically get a lot of equity and it's typically really, really inexpensive to buy those stock options uh, really, really early on in the lifespan of a company. So like seed, uh, seed round or series A, sometimes in the series B, those stock options could still hover around like maybe $2 or less. I would say seed round and into series A, those stock options are usually, in my experience, uh, those stock options have typically been somewhere between 10 cents to maybe 50 cents. Once they get into like series B, you're probably into dollars for those stock options. Once the, the company starts getting to like series C, series D, maybe a series E, you're probably thinking about going public at that point. And that's where like the valuation starts going like way off the way off the scale. And sometimes they'll do a stock split to bring that value back down. Because if they do go public, they don't want to be like, we're going public for $1,000 a share. No one's going to buy them. But if, if they do a stock split to where, you know, uh, a typical IPO is going to be somewhere in the 10 to $25 range, people are more like, like the general public are more likely to buy those shares. Um, and so the, the enticing part of working for a startup is they want you to buy that equity and invest back in the company at like 10 cents a share so that when you go public at $25 a share, you're going to be, you know, making all this money. Um, but it's, it's important to understand how equity plays out uh, with some of that stuff. The reason that I call this a, a, an overly risky move, especially for a new grad, if you're coming out of a CS program, you've probably got some pretty massive debt. Even if you're coming out of a code school or a, or a coding program of some kind, you've probably got some amount of student loan to pay off. If you were privileged enough that you don't have that kind of debt, then fine. But if you've got that kind of debt, being paid a lower salary is going to be a bit risky to try to pay all that stuff back and you know deal with cost of living depending on where you live. And so it is uh, a very serious consideration that you need to make, uh, that that startup salary may not give you as much take home pay as you might like or that you could get at another job and the 
you know, while that equity has a perceived value, it doesn't actually have a tangible value. You can't take those stock options to a bank and say, you know, I want a, I want a car loan and here's all these stock options as collateral. They, they won't take it because the stock options, they recognize it's, a, it's an option to buy stock in a private company that means nothing. Um, and so it's not actual, like a tangible asset that's worth money on the real market. There are secondary markets where you can like buy and sell private equity, but, um, but that's like a topic for a whole other discussion sometimes. Working at a startup though, especially with that equity though, it can be very lucrative, especially if you stay a really long time because that salary is also going to climb a little bit over time, but having that sort of uh, early stage equity can actually turn into a lot of money. Like it could easily turn into six figure money, if not seven figure money, depending on when you got in, how much equity you got, how much you're buying, how much that grows over time. One thing I would say, especially at a startup though, um, because the salary may, not always, may start a little bit lower than average, you wanna document the heck out of everything you do keep tons of notes get get a notebook of some kind i typically keep like one of these moleskin notebooks near me all the time and i'm constantly writing stuff down in my notebooks write down everything you do everything that you have a hand in every project that you touch write all that stuff down if for nothing else than just nostalgia but when you get ready to ask for that raise you're going to use that as your documentation as to why you deserve that raise. You can say, look at all the stuff I've been involved in. Look at all the things I've done. Look at the accomplishments I've made. I contributed to this code and it made that thing three times faster. Or we were under a time crunch to get that uh, feature finished. And I was able to finish that within the allotted amount of time that you wanted that thing finished. You need to be able to document that stuff and advocate for yourself in order to get that raise. And so you definitely want to bring that up. And the only way you're going to be able to bring that up is if you document it, because that's the only way you're going to remember it. Um, I was going through some old resumes of my own recently, and there was a position at SendGrid when I worked there that they wanted me to sort of apply for this role internally and like actually interview for this role. And as part of that process, they're like, we need you to put together a resume. So I put together a resume of everything that I had done at SendGrid and actually kept a copy of that resume. And I pulled it up recently just because I was, you know, I was looking for example resumes because I was showing somebody like different ways of, of building out a resume. And a couple of things struck me about mine, how I did like this two column, like even width, like centered kind of layout. And, and looking back on it now, I'm like that resume layout was horrible. But looking back through that resume of like, I was involved in this project and this project and this project, and I built this and I did an R&D project about that. And I worked with our technical account managers on this, 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 this. And I'm like, wow, I actually did a lot of stuff there. And some of it I had completely forgotten. Like most of the time I talk about SendGrid, I worked on like two or three projects. I worked on like almost 20 things at the company. And it's kind of ridiculous that I had forgotten all but like two or three of those things. And so unless you're documenting that stuff and writing it down, you're not gonna remember it. So you gotta, you gotta document that stuff. Um, now there are sites where you can kind of keep track of that stuff. Um, you know, if you want to use like polywork or read.cv or something like that, but keep in mind that some projects are private and your company is not going to want you to post that stuff publicly. And so be sure that you're not, uh, violating non-disclosure agreements. If you're going to put it on some sort of public system. Um, but sometimes even just your own notes like Evernote or Google keep or something like that. Um, you can keep track of, of those kinds of things and then bring that up when you're asking for a raise later on. Um, as startups raise rounds of funding, that's the perfect time to hit them up for a raise and say, hey, now that we got all this money, can you bring me closer to market value? Because now that I've been here for a year, a year and a half, you know, my base salary should be about here to be on par with other peers. Um, and I would really like to kind of be on equal footing with my peers. And, you know, if they're if they're flush with money, they're more likely to give you that raise. But you also need to show them like, hey, I, you know, as a reminder, I've done all these things. Um, because you don't want to just walk in and be like, I want more money now. You got money in the bank, so I want a piece of that. You have to explain why you deserve that money. So be prepared to advocate for yourself and negotiate for that, um, especially as your startup is is raising rounds of funding.
Cool, as always, if you got questions, feel free to drop those in chat as we go. We've got a handful more here that we'll cover and then uh, we'll wrap up for the night. This next question is a little bit long. A job application is asking me to quantify how many years of experience I have in a tech stack. I've been using this particular framework off and on for many years, but I haven't really used it professionally and I don't know it as well as the tech stack that I do use at my job every day for the past year. So really the question here that they're asking, uh, and I'm just gonna use some technologies as, as an example. Um, the company is saying, you know, we want you to have two or three years in React, for example, but maybe you've kind of tinkered with React on the side, you've maybe done like little side projects and you've used it kind of off and on here and there, but on the job, Maybe you're using Angular or Vue or something else. And so you're not using React in a professional setting, but you've been using it for a long time, kind of off and on. Does that really mean that you've got two to three years of experience? So what I would typically tell people is like, if, you, if you're trying to qualify it based on what they're sort of requiring, in quotes, what they're requiring as years of experience in a tech stack, you do need to be honest about it. If you just sit down and say like, oh yeah, I've been using React for three years, but you haven't really. If you were to actually sit down and quantify all of the projects where you've used it and how much time you actually spent on building out those projects. And you can go back and uh, this is why like me personally, for example, I use Git here at home. All of my side projects, I use Git and I'll push stuff up to GitHub and put them in private repos and so on. I can go back and look at those Git commits and now I can kind of build a timeline of when I actually worked on things and roughly maybe how long it took. Um, the, the how long it took, you can really only determine if you're doing a lot of back-to-back -back commits. But I think you can still get an idea, like an approximate idea of, okay, well, over that two or three years, maybe I did like actually six months worth of like what, what I would consider like full-time effort on a project using React. Now you've got a much more honest answer that when you go apply for that job, you can say, okay, I don't have three years. I've been using it over the span of three years. But if I were to sit down and like kind of clump all of that into full-time work effort, it would probably be only six months worth of effort. So it can be a little bit tricky to quantify those things, but I think you need to be careful not to misrepresent yourself. It's very, very easy to say, oh yeah, I've been using React for three years. But if you get into the interview and they're like, oh cool, you've been using this for three years. So I should be able to ask you questions about this, 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 this. And I should be able to see a progression in your skill. But if all you've built is like a hello world and a to-do list, you know, task manager kind of thing, it's like, okay, well, you built that over the span of three years, but that's like a month worth of work, maybe you know, maybe a couple of weeks worth of work. That's not three years worth of work. And so you have to be careful not to misrepresent yourself because all it takes is for them to question one thing on your resume and your whole resume gets put into suspicion. And they're gonna wonder like, well, okay, what else have you embellished on your resume? Or is this person just a dirty stinking liar and we just need to throw out the whole resume? So be careful about misrepresenting yourself because if they catch a hint that you've misrepresented yourself, like I said, everything about you is, is now suspicious and they may just say, okay, cool, thanks. We'll, uh, we'll let you know if we're gonna move forward and they just drop you out of the system. So be careful about how you're quantifying that stuff. And, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in doing things with integrity. You should represent the actual skill that you have on a resume and you need to be able to speak honestly and clearly about it, even if you think that that's gonna put you at a disadvantage I think it does come across much more genuine to say, you know what, I've been using React off and on for two or three years, but I actually sat down and I looked at how much work I actually did on these side projects, and it really only turned out to be about six months worth of effort. But I've been using Angular for a year, so combined, now I've got like a year and a half of experience professionally or and, and side project doing framework kind of work. And the company might be like, you know what, a year and a half is fine, that's fine. We were looking for two to three years, you got a year and a half, close enough. Keep in mind as well that my job post is kind of my wish list. I'm, I'm hoping that I can find somebody with all of those skills, but I'm probably not gonna find somebody 
with all of those skills. Otherwise, I'm going to end up paying an enormous salary. And so there are concessions I'm going to make as a hiring manager and as an interviewer of like, okay, what do you know? What don't you know? I'm going to take that back to my hiring manager and see whether that actually fits in what we're looking for. And it's okay not to have 100% of that as a, as a match. But I think it is definitely important to do things with integrity, represent yourself properly, and represent yourself well as far as what you know and what you don't know and how long you've actually used these skills. Because I could, like, for example, I could go out tonight and I could just write a quick little Perl script, for example, and then put on my resume. It's like, oh yeah, I've been using Perl since 1997 through 2021. Well, that doesn't mean I've actually been using that skill for, gosh, how many years is that? 24 years? <clears throat> doesn't mean I've actually been writing Perl for 24 years. I, I stopped writing Perl back in like 2010, 2009, 2010, 2009, I stopped writing Perl. I don't think I've written any Perl code since 2009. But if I go write a Perl script tomorrow, that doesn't mean I've now been using it since 2009. So I'm not gonna represent myself that way on my resume. In fact, I don't even put some of my technical skills on my resume because I don't wanna work in Perl anymore. I don't wanna work in PHP anymore. I'm not even gonna put them on my resume as a skill that I have. If they really want to see that, they're going to go look at LinkedIn and they'll see that I've got that skill and they'll see where I've used it, but they're also going to see when I stopped using it and that I haven't used it since. So I believe in, in being really clear, being really honest about representing yourself well. I think that the genuineness that comes across from that and the integrity that comes across from that can actually benefit you, even if you think it's going to put you at a disadvantage. All right, we've got another new grad question here. I am a relatively new grad. I've been at my job for five months. The company has more than a thousand people and I don't feel like I'm doing enough work. Is this common in the tech industry? This was kind of interesting to sort of read through and kind of puzzle through what what kind of goes through the mind of, of people that are asking these questions, not, not in a negative way, but like what's really going on in their workplace that these are the feelings that they have. So I, this question again is going to be a little bit longer than, than usual. I would start out by saying it's okay not to work a ridiculous number of hours at, at your job every week. I've worked those jobs. I've burned myself out at jobs. It's okay not to do that. It's absolutely okay not to do that. I think it's important to have a balance in your life that work doesn't have to be your life. It's okay to have time to do hobbies. It's okay to spend time with friends and family and the people that you care about. So is this a common thing in the industry of like, I feel like I'm sitting around twiddling my thumbs. I would suggest it's probably going to be more common in larger companies than in smaller companies. In a previous Q and A uh, question, I was kind of talking about startups and how everybody's jumping in and diving in and working on a lot of things. In smaller companies, your, your work is going to be more visible. And so what you're working on and what you're not working on is going to be noticed more in a very small company than it would be in a very large company. But that's not to say that your contributions are completely unnoticed in large companies. I would question a little bit why you think you're not doing enough work if you are accomplishing the goals that they've set out for you, you're doing it in an efficient enough manner to have some free time, then I think you could communicate that to the company. And also continue to document the heck out of what you do. Grab a little notebook, write down all this stuff, write down all the things that you've been involved in and what those contributions have been. But communicate that back to the company. If you really do have free time during the work week, you could probably spend the remaining time, like what are you learning? What are you exploring about other systems at work? How are you stretching yourself to become better? If you're just sitting back and waiting to be told to do something and then you do that thing and then you just kind of like sit back and twiddle your thumbs until they give you something else to do, from a company's perspective, it can show a lack of initiative. 
Like, yeah, you're a hard worker. I give you something to do and you get that thing done. But if you can't find a way to keep yourself busy, even if that's learning something and like leveling up your own skill, it could hurt your chances at a promotion later on. And what's going to end up happening is you're going to get unhappy because you're not being promoted. And so you're going to leave the company so you can go get that promotion somewhere else. But that other company is also going to want to see that you're progressing in your skill as well. So if you've got, if you find you've got extra time, use that time to level up some other skill, learn another programming language, or go explore other systems um, and, and figure out how do these things communicate together can I go shadow somebody and, and watch what they do? Um, could you be documenting anything? Could you be drawing out, say, architecture diagrams? Uh, again, kind of learning how these systems communicate with what you just worked on. Could you ask to pair program with somebody more senior in the company to learn about what they do? How did they get to where they are? What can you learn from them that's going to make you better at your job? Um, learn how they do code reviews. Like when you wrote that code and you submitted it and it got merged in and deployed, like how did they do that code review? Like sit in with them and learn from them. How did, you know, or if they took the code that you wrote and they found some optimization, like how did they find that optimization? Go learn from them. Like just, you know, get a brain dump from them and, and document all that stuff. Like I sat down with Ian and, you know, we pair programmed for you know, X number of hours. And in that time, these are the things that I learned and these are the topics and blah, blah, blah. You can find ways of filling that time. But if you're just sitting back and you're kind of twiddling your thumbs, waiting for the company to give you something to do, it's going to show as a lack of initiative of keeping yourself busy. Just because they don't have work for you doesn't mean you can't find a way to fill that time. There will be no shortage of things to do if you go looking. If you do go look and you really don't see any opportunity to grow, then you need to ask for that opportunity. You do need to be careful not to overwhelm yourself, especially if you're new in the industry and you're a relatively new grad or new at the company, you, you don't want to take on too much. So what I would suggest is like if they're if they're sort of allocating, like we think Ian is going to get this much work done and you finish that and you've got like an extra day left over, then you could say, hey, you know what? last sprint you know let you know if you let's say you're working on, on like a two-week sprint say last sprint you gave me all this work to do and i found by the end of the sprint i had an extra day um next sprint could i take on like one additional task just to make sure that i'm i'm filling up that time or is there a process that i can do that if i do find myself with a little extra time that i could maybe start something ahead of the following sprint or something like that or how can I fill that time? Like ask the company, they'll help you as well. Um, so maybe taking on that additional task um, until you're satisfied that you're handling your new workload well and that they are satisfied that you're also handling that new workload well, and then move it again and say, okay, well, I took on one new thing and I still had extra time. So I'm gonna take on another new thing, but don't overwhelm yourself and go, you know, I've got all this extra time. I want to take on like five new things. You don't want to miss deadlines. You don't want to be so over eager that you're missing deadlines to where now you have to work extra hours to make up for it. So go slow. But I would say talk to the company about it. If you if you feel like you have idle time, talk to the company. They will help with that. They They want to pay you for your skill. They want to pay you what you're worth. They want to pay you to get that work done. But they also don't want to waste that money. So if you're sitting around and you literally have nothing at all to do, then you should ask the company about it and have them give you some direction. But if they say like, oh, you know what? Like we haven't got a lot of time or, you know, why don't you go sit with so-and-so? Um, or they may want to see like, how do you take on your own initiative? And how do, how do you go find things to do? Anything that you can kind of document on behalf of the team is going to make the whole team better. In other questions that I've answered on the stream, I talk about when you're applying for that job, you're going to talk to them about what you bring to the team and how you're going to help the team and make the team better. That would be a good example in that next job to say, you know what, I had extra time. And so I was documenting all these other things. And that meant that new people coming on the team, they onboarded 20% faster because we had all this stuff documented. Those are really good data points to tell the next job. 
but it's also a really good data point to bring to your boss and say, hey, I'd like a raise because I've been doing all this extra stuff that, you know, the last three people you hired, they onboarded faster than I did when we didn't have this documentation. And so, you know, I'm helping out the team. I'm making the team better because I've been writing this stuff and I've been contributing. And I think that it, it shows kind of that initiative. So find ways of filling up your time. You don't have to sit back and wait for the company to give you work. You can find things to do. What are some decent paying jobs in tech that don't require programming? So on November 14th, uh, 2021, if you're watching this video later, listening to this podcast later on, we did a whole segment where I had a number of people on the stream, a uh, bunch of my former students from Turing who got into tech adjacent roles like DevOps, um, QA, sales engineering, and shoot, blanking on the fourth one. It was DevOps, sales engineering, QA, Dang it, I can't remember who the fourth one was. I apologize to the person that I had on the stream. Um, but I was also trying to get like a technical writer or someone in developer relations and things like that uh, to talk about what they do because there are lots of tech adjacent roles as we would call them. And so you can find that old video on YouTube. You can go check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Ian Douglas. And you can go find that video and go hear about a, a handful of those types of jobs. Many of the roles that we chatted about, though, even on that stream, involved some amount of programming. Some of those roles more than others, but there are roles that are not just full-time software development. For example, in sales engineering, it was maybe like 80% sales and a lot of conversation versus actual like sit down and coding. Um, the person who is talking about their role in DevOps you're probably doing more scripting around automations for things like deployments and so on, but you're still effectively writing software for an automation. Uh, product management, project management, uh, data science was, was the fourth one, uh, you know, or, or doing some kind of visualization or something like that. Like there's still gonna be like maybe some SQL that you're doing to actually extract stuff from a database to go do some visualization. Like SQL is still technically kind of a programming language where you're piecing together like how to build a result set of some kind. So there are gonna be like little bits of programming in a lot of these kinds of roles. Uh, QA and QE, for example, like quality assurance and quality engineering, those roles may do a lot more around automation and, and looking for things like edge cases and, and how to have, you know, the different systems sort of spin up and communicate with one another and making sure that everything's behaving properly. I think even studying programming a little bit is going to help you in a lot of those roles. But I think when, when we talk about the tech industry, I think it's important to realize that there is tech in a lot of other industries. We typically talk about the tech industry, like go work for a technology company. But I think that there are also a lot of regular companies that are now introducing technology. And those companies are also going to have opportunity to do some amount of technical work, whether it's full-time programming or even a little bit of programming. So I think even studying programming a tiny bit is gonna help you get into those other kinds of companies. And if not, like if, you know, let's say you want to get into like product management or project management, having a background where you've studied at least a little bit of programming and a little bit of software development. I can speak from experience that as an engineer on a team, you will find that you have more respect coming from the team when you have a little bit of technical skill and you can show them that you can relate to what they're going through it's like oh yeah okay cool yeah i know that you know this project is going to take a little while because you've got these systems that you have to orchestrate and you know blah 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 and you got to go write those api endpoints and they're going to be like oh wow you know about writing api endpoints you can say oh yeah you know i did it you know on a small project on the side like i understand what you're going through when you're actually sitting down and writing that code that's going to give you a lot more respect from people on the team 
It doesn't mean you have to be as deeply knowledgeable about the technology as the people on the team. But in my own experience, I've, I've tended to have a lot more in common with and therefore more respect for product managers, project managers, and so on who come from a technical background, who have some amount of technical skill. Again, it doesn't mean they have to be a programmer, but that they've at least looked into programming a little bit to understand what I go through as part of my job. So there are good paying jobs out there that don't require programming, but I think having a little bit of knowledge about programming can make you more effective on a team. I think, again, it just, it shows that you've got a little bit of common ground that you understand what other teammates are going through and, and kind of the impact that that has on them. And I think that that can really help kind of build that trust and camaraderie within a team. Cool, we've been going for close to an hour and a half. If there are other, other questions, please drop them in chat. I'm happy to address those as we go. Otherwise, I may do maybe one more question or I may just wrap up for the night, uh, depending on who else is out there. So if you're out there on chat, say hello. Let me know you're there. Uh, if you do have any other questions or commentary, I'm also happy to take perspectives from folks in chat on any of the answers that I've given on the stream. If you've got perspective, I'm more than happy always to say like, hey, so-and-so in chat also had this to say. I'm more than happy to share that kind of as we go as well. So I'll wait a little bit and see whether other folks have uh, questions. We'll drop those in chat. And then I think I'll start to wind down a little bit, and get some of these questions cleared out. So I still have a handful of questions that, that I can go through uh, maybe on Sunday. And some of those questions and answers are also gonna be uh, rather long as well. Um, at the very beginning of the stream, I kind of alluded to doing a giveaway. So I've got a number of things that are printing on the, on the farm of 3D printers over here. Um, and I've also been 3D printing like these cool little snowflakes. Like literally I've been printing snowflakes. Uh, they're, they're meant to be little ornaments. And so some of them are multiple colors like white and gold. Some of them are just like, you know, transparent and silver or transparent and gold. So you get kind of a cool like depth effect. And some of them are just solid colors. Um, but uh, yeah, typically we would we would be selling these at a, at a winter festival at, uh, at my kid's school, but um, I don't think we're running the festival this year. But I did find some other really cool stuff to 3D print. And so we're gonna do a giveaway uh, probably towards the end of November, maybe early December. We're gonna do some giveaways and I will ship these things pretty much anywhere in the world. So we'll probably do that in, uh, let's do like early December and I'll get them shipped out and hopefully you get it for the holidays. Um, there are some pretty cool things. So I think I'll do uh, a handful of giveaways and, and see if I can uh, 3D print some, uh, some fun stuff for folks and do that as a giveaway at some point. But uh, I think if there are no other questions in chat, I think I will probably drop off for the night. I haven't seen anything come in, so let's see, who should we raid? Is there anybody even to raid? Midnight Simon's online. Sith, Sith Lord Brit is online uh, doing some cool maker stuff, um, doing some 3D printing. Uh, Chris Perillo is online doing an Apple Watch unboxing. Yeah, maybe. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Karsten, good to see you in chat. First time chat. Hello. Enjoyed the stream as always. Cool. Thanks for, uh, thanks for chatting. Let me know you're out there. Appreciate that. Um, always happy to take uh, commentary and questions and, and things like that. Uh, kind of curious, uh, Karsten, how did you find the stream? Um, like, how did you hear about Tech Interview Guide? How long have you been uh, hanging out on the stream? Uh, you know, tell me about your journey. Are you new in tech? Have you been around a minute? Uh, I'm always eager to learn about who's sitting in on the stream and, and what kind of advice you're finding helpful. Uh, so feel free to uh, drop some of that in chat as we go too. Also, a big thank you to Indecisive Spaz and Wraith Cube for follows uh, a couple of days ago um, that I missed after the fact on the, on the stream. Always appreciate uh, new folks coming by and folks redeeming their uh, sort of interview points that I, that I call the, uh, the little coins there under the chat um, to remind me to hydrate and tell dad jokes and, and stuff like that. So appreciate, uh, appreciate folks that want to be uh, a little more interactive in, in chat for sure. 
because I don't want to just be like another guy on the internet just spouting opinions and, and so on. Like I want to I want to be interactive on the on the chat too. So if you have questions and, and stuff like that. Uh, so Carson says, I recently graduated from Prime, Prime Academy. Awesome. Cool. I caught your session with us a month ago. Been following on the stream since. Awesome. I appreciate that. Um, I think, is it Prime Academy that I've got another talk uh, next week? I'm doing a talk on uh, stock equity. Uh, I forget if that's with Prime or if that's with General Assembly. I forget. Uh, but yeah, I love uh, I love helping out on those kinds of things. So hit up the hit up the folks at Prime and say like, hey, Ian's eager to come do another talk sometime. But uh, yeah, cool. Glad uh, glad that you found uh, some of those sessions helpful. Um, that was probably let's see, Prime Academy was probably the company research session that I did on uh, like company research and how to do network and outreach. Is that uh, the session that I did? <coughs> Awesome. Cool. Well, I think I'll wrap up for the night. We're uh, going right on an hour and a half here. So I'll wrap up here and then, um, yeah, we'll see you on Sunday. Yeah, the company research. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Um, and I, I also documented that in a YouTube video too. So uh, anybody watching after the fact, if you're curious what I taught about how to research companies to know where you even want to apply for a job, you can go find that on YouTube. I'll drop the YouTube uh, link here in chat. Um, or if you're watching this on YouTube, you're already there. Just go search YouTube and uh, you can look for just the words company research and you'll see kind of a, a little spreadsheet that I put together and, and talk about like what's important to you. Um, and then how do you use the information that you find and more importantly, the information you cannot find as part of the network and outreach when you're talking to people at a company. How do you talk to them about the information that you couldn't find and the information that you could find to verify what you did find? and then also fill in gaps of what you could not find. I think it's an important, uh, important move to research a company to know what you're getting yourself into so that you're not surprised by the interview process, you're not surprised by the company, you're not showing up on day one going, oh, I didn't realize that Big Tobacco was your number one customer and I am morally against that and now I don't want to work here anymore. Uh, those would be the kinds of things you want to find out ahead of time if possible. Cool. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap up there. Uh, thanks for hanging out on the chat. Thanks for the questions in chat. And uh, we'll see you on Sunday. Again, I may not stream next Thursday because it will be Thanksgiving here in America. Um, but I might. So uh, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and comment on here if you want me to stream next Thursday or if you're in chat and you really want me to stream next Thursday. Um, or send me a direct message on Twitch as well. Or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm just Ian Douglas 736 on uh, a lot of the social medias. Um, oh, I was actually asked today, like, what is that 736 all about? Um, it, was, or it, was, it was actually uh, Jonan's uh, stream last night. He's like, yeah, I know it's Ian Douglas, but he's got numbers after it. And I, don't, I can never remember what those numbers are. The 736 is kind of a throwback and uh, kind of a... Uh, a note from my wife. Uh, it's how we met online. Um, I was on like one of these dating websites where, you know, you put in the, the username that you want to use and it just tacked on some random numbers just to make sure that everybody had a unique username. And I didn't meet her on that website, but I started using that username on other websites so that if people found me on one, they could find me on other websites and so on. Uh, well, she ended up uh, not being a paid member on the website where we ended up actually seeing each other's profiles. Um, but she used my username as my instant message handle, which also happened to be the same. What a coincidence. And reached out over instant message. And uh, we connected on a Thursday. We met for a coffee on a Monday. And we've been together ever since. And so the 736 is really just a shout out to my wife. Love you, hun. Thanks for putting up with me and my live stream and all the nonsense that I do. And yeah, so that's what the 736 is all about. Um, but yeah, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter. If you've got questions, if you want feedback on things, uh, definitely uh, send me some resumes. I am absolutely looking for some resumes to do some resume reviews. I do have a very senior HR person who wants to come hang out on the stream. And I want to have a whole bunch of resumes to kind of go through with Josh. Um, and so I would love for folks to submit resumes, even if you don't think it's super polished. Uh, that's totally all right. Send me a resume anyway. Uh, I want to get Josh's opinions and, and feedback on how an HR person 
looks at a resume and decides in a hurry, is this person somebody I should call? Um, and so we will uh, we'll have a couple of resumes ready for Josh to kind of review and then talk about what he looks for as an HR rep and what I would look for as a, as a hiring manager on the technical side and how those views are gonna differ and how what I look for in a resume is not what he looks for in a resume. Um, and so I think it'll be, it'll be pretty interesting to kind of go through that. And I would love to have like four or five resumes to go through. So please drop me a resume. Um, you can submit it on techinterview.guide slash streaming. And uh, we'll do all of those on a live stream probably in early December. Um, I think he wanted to be on the stream next week, but next Thursday is going to be Thanksgiving. So we may do the following Thursday. Um, so yeah, get those resumes in. We'll have like a week or two and I'll kind of batch those up, but send those in at your convenience. And uh, like we're, we'll, do the, we'll do the resume review, not, not so much to critique it, but really just from the perspective of like, what do we look for? Like what's going to stand out on that resume for me as a hiring manager and what stands out to him as an HR, uh, like, a, like a senior HR person or VP of HR? Uh, what kinds of things would Josh be looking for on a resume to know if you're somebody that, they sh that he should call or his team should call? Cool. All right, I'm going to wrap up here. I went way over time, uh, but it's all good hanging out. And we'll see you on Sunday. Have a good night, everyone.